This is a dime. This is a grain of rice. And this is the AT Tiny 10 microcontroller. Look how small it is. This microcontroller might be small, but it can do quite a few things. So what we're going to talk about today is how to get started with this microcontroller, wiring up a programming jig. Then I'm going to show you how to use the software to actually program it and use the 12 volt high voltage programming mode so the reset line can be used as I.O. And then we'll make a sample program where this thing actually does something somewhat useful. All right, let's get started. Okay, here's the data sheet for the Atmel AT Tiny 10 microcontroller. Let's go to the pin configuration right away. All right, so we have this package, SOT23. So there's only uh, four I.O. pins on it, and one of them is the reset line. So what we want to do is we want to use that reset line as an I.O. In order to do that, we need to have a high voltage programmer. So there's uh, three common programmers for Atmel devices. There's the AVR ISP Mark II, there's the AVR Dragon, and the Atmel ICE. Now, each one of these can handle different devices and has different features, but there are a few uh, gotchas. For instance, this micro uses the TPI interface, the tiny programming interface, and none of the programmers I just mentioned have the ability to do high voltage programming and the TPI mode, even though this chip supports high voltage programming. Okay, so basically we put the reset pin low and then we can put data on the TPI clock and data lines and program the device. Or if we put 12 volts on the reset pin, we can also program the device. So basically zero volts or 12 volts on the reset line will put this device into programming mode. So what we need to do is make an adapter so the standard AVR ISP Mark II can do high voltage programming. Here's another drawing. Uh, we just have our uh, AT Tiny 10 here. This is the standard uh, pin configuration of the AVR ISP Mark II. Uh, master in, slave out, zero clock, master out, slave in, voltage, reset, ground. This is what you'd use for most of your standard uh, uh, AVR devices like an Arduino. So if the device is in TPI mode, which it does support, it will be this pinout, data, clock, so this is going to be uh, half duplex data. Uh, resets the same, this one's not used, and then you have your target voltage and ground. So what we need to do is we need to take this into Eagle and drop a schematic. Okay, now we're in Eagle. This is all you need to make a high voltage programming converter for the AVR ISP Mark II. Okay, so we have a header block here. This is going to be uh, 12 volts, 5 volts, and ground. We'll get that from just your standard PC power supply. The uh, ISP header for programming, it's labeled for uh, spy mode, but we'll just wire it up for TPI mode. Then we have our AT Tiny representation right here. We're going to have a few resistors, an indicator LED, a PNP transistor. I'm using a TIP 107, an optocoupler and then three toggle switches. So the programmer has its reset line right here and it's active low, which means it's normally high. So we can actually use that to drive the optocoupler. So if you don't know what an optocoupler does, basically it's a little package that has an LED inside of it and also a photo transistor that reacts to the LED. So when the LED is illuminated by passing current through it, the photo transistor will saturate allowing current through it. So basically this allows you to control something else, but have complete electrical isolation from it. So yeah, check this out. I'm gonna take this resistor and duplicate it. Kaboom. And let's go over here. Let's take this, let's add some lines. It's called 12V, 5V, and ground. Cool. Then up here, let's connect this resistor to the optocoupler because it's still an LED, so you still need to have a current limiting resistor on it. Now we can just go to our uh, label right here and call this five volts. So we're gonna connect five volts through a resistor and uh, let's just use, you know, 100 ohms is a pretty common value. All right, so the reason we're doing it this way is because as we mentioned, reset is active low. So we have five volts going into the LED here, but if we have five volts here, the LED won't illuminate. It'll only illuminate if there's a path to ground. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come down here and go to the reset line. So if reset goes low, then current will pass through the LED, 
boom, the optocoupler is activated. Okay, so this is our PNP transistor. We have the emitter base collector. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to attach the base to the collector of the phototransistor on the optocoupler, right? Okay, so this resistor we're going to have, we're going to make, make it 10K. So let's attach 12 volts to the emitter of the PNP transistor and have the 10K resistor pull the base up to 12 volts as well. So in a PNP, when the base is high, the PNP will not uh, allow current through. When the base goes low, that's when current can go through. So by pulling it high, we basically ensure that it is stable until we want it to conduct. So what we do here, the other side of the uh, transistor, and as you can see, this is an NPN transistor, this one will go to ground. All right, so when nothing's going on, when this reset line is high, this LED cannot light. When the reset goes low, current flows through the LED, thus activating the phototransistor. Now what happens here is this is pulled high, but once the phototransistor is activated, this will be pulled low to ground, and boom, the 12 volts passes through the MPN transistor, and we have 12 volts on the collector. So let's call that uh, program 12 because it's different than the 12 volt power supply source. The reason you have to hook up voltage to the VCC line is because if the programmer does not see the correct operating range, it will not program. All right, let's bring our microcontroller down here and we'll connect ground and power to this as well. Wow, Eagle's a really noisy program. Bling, bling, bling. All right, so this is where the toggle switches come in. So here's the deal. Uh, we have our data line and our clock line for programming on the ATtiny, but if we're breadboarding, we're probably also going to be hooking other things up to it, like LEDs, switches, sensors, etc. And if those things are hooked up while you're trying to program it, it might prevent it from going into programming mode properly because there'd be a load on the line that would affect the programmer. Not always, but often. That's why I have these toggle switches. So the toggle switch has three poles on it. The center pole is what's connected to the shaft. And that either goes to one pole or the other. So it basically allows you to use it as a selector. Uh, that is the TPI data line, which lines up to the upper left pin on the programmer. Okay, let's go back over here. So let's do this. Let's go TPI data goes here. So position one is going to go to the data line on the programmer. Same thing, the clock line. And then this will go down to the clock line of the microcontroller. And the other side of the toggle switch, that will simply go to a row of headers that we can use for programming. Same thing with the reset line. Let's go to the toggle switch. And that's either going to go to program 12 volts or again, a bank of headers. That's especially important uh, in this case because we don't want to put 12 volts into, you know, a Hall effect sensor or, you know, an LED. Oh, uh, there's one more thing that we need. Uh, we need to take a resistor here and connect it to the 12 volt program line and have it go to ground. All right, and we'll make that a 1K. Cool. Okay, let's go over the circuit one final time. We have our input terminal block. We'll hook that up to a PC power supply. Five volts goes into a 100 ohm resistor. It tries to illuminate this LED, but it can't as long as the programmer reset line is high. Oh, that reminds me, we do need one more thing. Uh, let's grab this resistor once again, like that. And let's put a pull up on this. 10K is a good value. Okay, this is gonna look a little sloppy. There we go. Okay, now we have the whole circuit here. Let's go over it. We have a terminal block, which is going to bring 12 volts, five volts and ground from a PC power supply. It's a very useful thing to get power from. Five volts goes into a 100 ohm resistor and it tries to illuminate the optocoupler's LED, but it can only work if the reset line goes low. 
And then we have a pull up from that to five volts again to ensure that it doesn't illuminate unless we actually want it to, unless the programmer wants it to. Other side of the output coupler, we have a photo transistor and when it's saturated, it will pull the base of a PNP transistor low, allowing 12 volts to flow into the program 12 volt line, which has a 1K pull down to ground to keep it stable when it's not activated. That goes into a toggle switch. And if the toggle switch, see how all the toggle switches are the one position means program. So if the toggle switches are all in the same direction, that means the microcontroller is hooked up to the programmer in programming mode. If you break all of the switches, the microcontroller is hooked up to a standard header bank for prototyping purposes. Microcontroller also has ground, five volts, and an indicator LED in it. If you only have four I.O. and you lose one of them to a reset line, getting that I.O. back is actually pretty important. Okay, now that we've discussed the schematic, let's wire it up in a breadboard form and see if it works. Okay, so I have this bin of surface mount adapters here. I get these from Marlon P. Jones and Associates. Let's see. Oh, oh, right there, right there. SOT 23. It's a little surface mount adapter on which we can mount our chip. So we're gonna go three and three with some headers. And the reason I'm using this board is so that the headers will be aligned straight for when we put them into uh, BMAR receptacles later on. Now a lot of people are scared of surface mount soldering. They're like, oh, it's impossible. All right, so this is one, two, three. So I'm gonna tin the third pad down on the right. There's gonna be a, uh, a mark on the chip, which is uh, pin one. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that the chip is flat. It's not past the end of the tweezers. Then really the main trick is positioning it correctly at the start. So I'm gonna position it and then just hit that one lower right hand pin. So it stays in position, right? Flip around, upper right hand pin. Now a lot of people might think, oh, I can't solder that accurately. Well, that's the thing with surface mount. You don't have to solder accurately. Watch this. Oh no. So you can just, as long as it's in the right place, you can just blob solder on and who cares? All you have to do is clean it up afterwards. So to do that, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can just make sure your iron is nice and clean. Then you just kind of grab the edge of it and pull it away. Basically, you're just giving the solder a lot of surface area on the iron to be attracted to, and that pulls it away from the pins. Of course, the other way you can do it is with a desoldering braid. This stuff, it's basically like a woven copper. Being a woven copper, it has increased surface area for sucking up solder. So with that, you just kind of put the braid on the solder, press down, and it'll suck it right up. You do want to be a little careful. Sometimes you can suck up too much solder and have a cold, cold joint left over. I don't have any three by ones, just four by ones, but that's fine. So again, I'm going to put the headers together. And I've got some of this uh, Radio Shack Bake Light prototyping board. When Radio Shack was going out of business and they had their online sales, Felix and I went online and we bought as much of this Bakelite as we could. I think I bought like, oh God, $1,500 worth of it on closeout. So I have a lot. Felix has a lot too. We both bought tons of it. I don't know. I like it because it's, uh, well, it's easy to break because it's Bakelite, not FR4. And uh, only has pads on one side, which might seem like a limitation, but actually when you have plated through hole via boards, that actually can be tricky because you have to think about things a little bit differently when you're soldering them. Okay, here's the board all wired up. We have our 12 volt, 5 volt ground terminal block inputs here. Tip 107 PNP transistor. Our programming header that goes to the ISP Mark II. Optocoupler for the 12 volt control, indicator LED, a couple of the resistors we talked about. Here's the toggle switches. So when they're to the right, that means we're in programming mode. To the left is in run mode. Then we have headers on either side. 
labeled PB0, PB1, PB2, PB3. PB3 is also the reset line. Uh, we don't have a toggle switch on PB2 because it's not used for anything else. Then I also have a uh, voltage and ground header banks here, and then also some buttons that we can hook up if we want to. Just take a quick look at the back. I basically did it with a bunch of cutoff leads from all of my resistors and whatnot. I keep all the leads, well, most of them, for this purpose. And uh, yeah, basically just did everything with a single-sided uh, Radio Shack bake light board. Ran a bunch of power traces, ground traces, and then jumped as little as possible. There's also a few surface mount resistors in here, like right there, I don't know if you can see it. That's the uh, 10K pull-up for the TIP-107. So this might look like a lot, but the thing is, once you've programmed the chip, then this, or just the chip, is all you really need. So you develop on this, and then you embed it in something else. Okay, we're going to be using a small PC power supply for this. When I use terminals like this, I like to double up the wires, just to make them a little bit thicker and ensure a good connection. So this thing will turn on when the PC power supply is turned on. And uh, to do that, you basically find the green wire on the power plug and then you connect it to ground. In my case, I've just added a toggle switch to do it. And that will activate your PC power supply. Pretty simple. Okay, so I'm just gonna take my AVR ISP Mark II and plug it in here. And we should be good to go. Let's plug this LED into PB2 for our first test. Okay, we're going to program this thing using Atmel Studio 7. This is the official IDE, Integrated Development Environment, for Atmel AVR devices. Okay, so uh, the first thing we want to do is go up to Tools, Device Programming. Okay, there's our tool, there's a device, Interface TPI. Hit apply and then see if we can read the signature off of the chip. Great, we got a signature and a target voltage, which is bang on. Of course, that might vary slightly. See that? All right, let's go down to fuses. Okay, there's only a few on this device. Uh, clock out, which puts the internal clock onto an external pin. Watchdog timer. And then the one that we're really curious about, reset disable. So if we enable this, we'll no longer be able to use a logic level low to reset the chip. We'll have to use 12 volts. It's actually going to warn us about that. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay, let's go to new project. CC, C++, uh, executable, great. Let's call it Tiny Tim in the, the spirit of the holidays. All right, so... Uh, IT tiny, tiny, okay. All right, here's our project, Tiny Tim. So since you're, you know, probably going to use IO, it just puts that library there for you there all automatically. There's other libraries we'll probably want to add later on. So <clears throat> uh, unlike Arduino, which you might be more familiar with, uh, in C, you have to have a main loop and then your infinite loop has to be manually set up inside of that. So if we didn't have a while loop here, if we just, you know, put a bunch of code here straight, it would execute and then the program would end actually. So we have to have a while loop there. All right, so if we look at the data sheet for this device, let's go into the pins. Okay, so PB2 doesn't have a toggle switch on it, so that's the easiest one to use. The IO ports, where's the magic? There it is. So here's our registers. So we're not using libraries, we're using registers. Uh, DD, which is direction, port, turns the pins on or off if they're outputs. Pull up enable, uh, adds a pull up resistor internally if they're inputs. And pin allows you to read the values if they're inputs. So let's go back over here and uh, we can do our, our one time setup before the while. So DDRB, and see since this is based off Visual Studio, it'll auto complete things for us, that's nice. So it's easy to think of this in binary. So 0B for binary, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So even though there's only four pins on this device, this register is still an 8-bit register. So it's uh, PB2, so that's the third pins. So we go 1, 2, 3, set that one to high, and that's going to be the output pin. Okay, so now on the main loop, let's just really simply port B equals, uh, you can do this, of course, or what most people do is you have one, Dun, dun, two. 
So you have the first bit, and then you bit shift it two to the left, which puts it in the PB2 position. Cool. So port B equals that. And then if you want to inverse it, uh, well, actually, we're just doing a straight assignment. So then port B equals that. Now port B equals zero. Cool. Let's see if that works. Let's program it. Okay, there we go. The LED is on. Oh, but why is it stuck on, even though we are toggling it on and off? Well, it's because it's toggling faster than we can see. Okay, so when we're getting into timing, we're going to want to uh, basically know what the speed of the chip is. So first we need the Configuration Change Protection Register, CCP. And basically what you do is you put a value into this register, and that allows you to change other protected registers. You have two cycles with which to do it. So we're going to go CCP equals D8 and hex. That's the code unlock protected registers. Now that we've done that, we have four cycles to change things. Da, 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 da. Clock prescaler register. Oh, there it is. Clock prescaler register. All right, so this register is the division factor. So one, two, four, eight. So that's the default. So eight megahertz divided by eight means it's one megahertz. So if we want to get the full speed out of this thing, we need to change this register. You can divide it quite a bit, actually. So, but we want it to be zero. So we're going to go back over here and after we've opened up the register, we're just going to put a zero in here. No divider equals eight megahertz. Cool. Now, if you want to actually use that delay, we need to go up here and, oh man, I can't type today, include AVR. See how it finds it for us? Oh, thank you, IntelliSense. Okay, AVR delay. Uh, but even before we do that, we need one more thing. We need to specify the frequency of the CPU. So we're setting the, uh, you know, the CPU frequency in our, uh, in our registers, but we also have to tell, you know, our compiler what it is. So it's eight, one, two, three, one, two, three, eight million. All right, cool. So now that it has this, this information and this, it can now create a proper delay. So we come down here. Okay, so we go down here. Let's see what we have for delay. Microseconds and milliseconds. All right, we want milliseconds. Cool. Let's try it. There we go. It's a thing of beauty. Hey, let's do this blinking a little bit more elegantly. So let's go down here. It's called void. Uh, I don't know, pins. And then, well, we only have one port, so we're going to have, uh, let's see, it's called a uint8, the pin, uint8, the state. Now, notice how I'm using a uint8, which is an unsigned integer, 8 bits. I'm doing that as so it is slapping in an int because this thing only has 32 bytes of RAM. So we want to make sure we use the smallest possible uh, variable types to hold the data we need. If the state, so if that's a one, we execute this, else we execute this, right? So if it's a one, port B or equals, that way it won't affect any of the other bits, one bit shifted the pin to the left. See? Now if the state is a zero, we go port B and equals the inverse of one bit shift the pin to the left. So we'll go pins. So it's two because it's PB2 and then it's uh, one, right? Pin two is a zero. Let's see if it works. Uh-oh, we got an error because we called a function before it was declared. So there's two ways we can fix this. We can copy this and put it before the main loop like that, which should compile. Yep. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can create a function prototype. So you can go down here. Basically, you just take this and then you bring it up here. This is like what you might see in a header file. So you just do that and then it will also work. So, I mean, this function is, you know, kind of luxurious for such a small uh, memory footprint. However, if you're, you know, doing a lot of uh, bitwise operations, it might work well. Although if you're in a really time sensitive uh you know, loop of some kind, 
if you jump out to this, this means you have a jump instruction, then another jump instruction here to execute the if then. And jump instructions actually consume a lot of cycles. I think it's two cycles, no matter what, is consumed by a jump. Uh, yeah, so it's handy, but it's slower. We should check to see if our reset line is truly usable. So I'm gonna move the LED over to it. Okay, let's just change this to a three. Send it over. And, oh, you know why it's not working? Because our DDRB was not changed. So let's, let's just make, uh, you know, one, two, three, four. Let's make them all outputs. Reprogramming, flip it back. And you see how it's blinking, but it's dimmer. So that shows you that this pin can be used as I.O., but it's not going to have as much source or sync capacity compared to the other three. Let's do an input example next. So I'm going to move the LED over here to PB0, just so it's a little bit more out of the way. And I've got these buttons here with uh, headers on them, so I can easily hook them up to my circuit. So let's hook up this button to PB2 and ground. Now for something completely different. All right, so we're using PB2 as an input, so we're going to set the uh, third bit here to a zero. All right, so that's gonna be an input. And then we're also going to use the pull up enable register. So let's just double check that. Pull up enable, or pew for short. Okay, so we're gonna want a zero on the DDB register and a one on the pull up enable register. So yeah, I'll do pull up enable B equals basically an inverse of that, see? So instead of having to add a pull up resistor on our circuit, there's one built into the microcontroller. We just have to enable it. Wow, we saved one cent. Okay, so how do we detect if that button's been pushed? Well, we need to do more binary bit masking. If pin B and so let's just type this out in binary, all right? One, two, three, four, zero, one, one, two. So, you know, basically the same value. So we're going to take the input register and AND it with this. And since there's only one bit set to one, that means if there's anything there, this will return a true. Because remember, it's, it's digital logic. So like if you put a zero here and you AND it, you know, PB with zero, that means it wouldn't have anything. So if this bit is high, that means it's a default state, then something, then it will do one thing. Else, if that bit is low, if the button is pushed, it'll do something else. Uh, so what we can do is we can actually just, instead of having the if then else, we can just invert this logic here. So if it's not high, so if you take this port and you and it with this number, and the result is no bits are remaining, that means the button's been pushed that means something will happen. So what we can do here is we can say, okay, so if the button is pressed, let's do pins zero, one, which is where our LED is now. Else, so I guess we did need an else after all, <laughs> pins zero, zero. Okay, let's try it out, send it over. Okay, let's turn that over so it's enabled. There you go, pretty simple. So. Now that it's hooked up to the oscilloscope, let's do a quick test. Pins, zero, one. Pins, zero, zero. All right, so we run this and we get a frequency of 1.93 approximately. You might be thinking that's not eight megahertz, but remember we have uh, loops, we have branching, we have an if then, all that takes time. Although it's still pretty efficient because think about it, this is just the frequency of the peaks. The valleys are also an instruction as well. So it's really running twice this speed. So it's closer to four megahertz, which is actually really good considering it's just an eight megahertz processor. So the C compiler is doing a really good job of making this as efficient as possible. Like if you wanted to make it completely cycle accurate, you could do assembly, but this actually isn't too far off from assembly. So, you know, this chip, is better for doing serial things like this than it is obviously IO input because it hardly has any. So what, what sort of cool serial stuff could we do with this chip? Well, what about a UART, like a 9600 baud serial device? Because then this thing could send information to other devices. If you think about 
serial communication, 9,600 baud. Well, that's 9,600 bits per second, right? And if you're talking serial, there's also a start bit before the eight bits of data. So that actually is counted in it. So even if it's 9,600 bits per second, it's not necessarily 9,600 divided by eight bytes per second because each data packet has nine bits. So we need to take that into account. So basically what we need to do is we need to divide the system frequency of eight megahertz by 9,600. And we'll do that using timers. So there's registers like timer counter, control register A, and also B. And again, it's all bitwise. These are your registers. And this one's kind of weird because one of the registers is actually crossed over both registers. See this WGM01 and, and 1? Waveform generation mode bit description, right? So like what kind of waveform we want to create. We have all these choices here and see how it's a four bit number. So <laughs> two of the bits are in one register and the other two bits are in the other register. Isn't that confusing? So uh, that's a bit how you doing. So let's see, what do we want? <laughs> so let's see, our clock source is no prescaling, so we want to actually use the 8 megahertz clock source. So this is going to have a 1 here in the low register. So let's actually go over here. So we've got TCCR0A basically equals nothing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, TCCR0B. This is going to be a little different. So we know the LSB is going to be 1 because we want uh, no clock divider, no prescaling. So we want it to actually count down at eight megahertz. So it's gonna count, you know, at full speed. Then we have these two uh, straggling bits here. So we got bit three and bit two of whatever that was. Okay, so this is the one we want. Clear timer on compare. So it's going to count a certain number of cycles. Then once it reaches that number, it's going to clear the timer and then start over again. So zero one zero zero. Okay, so the low two bits are zero zero. So okay, we got that in register A. So that's all zeros. And then zero one for the other one. So let's go to this. So this needs to be zero one. So uh, back over here. There, that should do it. So it's going to be. Uh, no prescaler, and then uh, clear timer on compare. Cool. So what's it comparing to? Well, that's another register we need to look at. Output compare register high byte. So if there's a high and low byte, basically that's how you have a 16-bit number in an 8-bit system. Okay, so this is going to be, we're going to basically use these two uh, registers to create our the number we want to count to. So here's a handy way of doing it. OCR0AH for high byte equals something. And then OCR0A low byte equals the lower part of the byte. 8 million divided by 9600, 833.5. 33333. Three, three, three. Let's go 833. So 833 doesn't fit in a byte. Uh, programmer, and then we can type 833. If you look at it in binary, it takes more than one byte. See? So what we do is we bit shift it. So the 1, 1 here, that's part of the high byte, and this pattern here is part of the low byte. High byte equals the number bit shift eight to the right. 833 bit shifted eight to the right gives us the top half of the byte. And for the low half of the byte, we take 833 and we end it with one byte. Okay, timer counter interrupt mask register. Wow, this is exciting. All right, so we are comparing on A. So we need to set that bit right there. So here's something fun you can do. If you actually like, Copy paste that from the data sheet, and then you can actually type in so Timska zero or equals, and then you do one bit shift that. And so this uh, bit pattern is actually a defined, so the, the compiler will know what you mean. 
Cool. So that will enable an interrupt. But the thing is, we need to have a place for the interrupt to go. Let's go up here above main void and do ISR timer zero compare a vector. So when that interrupt triggers, which will be 9600 times a second, this ISR will be called. And that'll be done automatically. So we don't even need to worry about it in our main loop. Makes sense. In fact, we can just here, let's just leave the main loop empty like that, right? And then all we're gonna do over here is let's let's just toggle the output pin. And we also need to include the AVR interrupt library as well. And finally, we need to enable interrupts with this command. You can also disable interrupts with that command. Okay, so let's see. We have our timer set up at 9600 hertz. We're enabling interrupts. We have the interrupt library added and then we have an interrupt to execute. All right, let's uh, send it over and flip the switch. Hey, there we go. Frequency is not quite right. I think we need to tweak that. Uh, but yeah, see, it's just basically doing a pulse at a certain frequency. So what we're actually gonna set this up to do is send one bit at a time. Hey, let's talk about the data format for RS-232 style communications. So we got two logic levels, high and low, five volts, zero volts. In the old days of RS-232, this was actually positive 12, negative 12, but this is the modern TTL version. Okay, so you always have a start bit to begin with. So that's transition from the five volt level to the zero volt level. That tells the system, hey, there comes a byte, right? And then the uh, next eight pulses are the bits. And we're going to be starting at LSB, least significant bits, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? Uh, so if you were sending a value of just one, you know, like the number one, uh, this would go high. And then the rest of it would be low. Beautiful drawing, right? Or if you're sending, you know, 255, the whole thing would be high like that. So high is the default state that the system waits in. That's why you have to have a low start bit. So you have some sort of change, which tells the system, hey, here comes a byte of data, right? So what we're gonna do, I think, is make like a state machine in the ISR, the interrupt service routine. So it's gonna say, okay, what bit are we on? So based off what bit we're on, we'll either send a zero or one. So there'll be nine iterations to this, including the final iteration, which is after all the bits are sent, no matter what, go back to high. Okay, let's start by creating some variables. Static volatile, because it's going to be used in an interrupt. Char, one character. Xmit, that's what we're going to be sending each time. Static volatile uint8, which bit out. So that's how we're going to keep track of our state machine. And let's set up a switch case state machine. Switch, which bit out. So this will be called 9600 times a second, no matter what. Now, whether or not there's any data to send, that depends on if there's anything in the buffer. Okay, so let's, let's do this. Okay, so the first possible thing that could be happening, case one, because it can't be zero, because case zero means nothing is happening. Case one is the start bit, right? So start bit, as we mentioned, is low. So we're gonna go port B and equals the inverse of one. Go low for start bit. It's always good to comment your code. And now which bit out equals two. Advance to next state. Okay, so the next thing that can happen is the eight bits of data. So we're gonna do case two, dot, 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 nine, the data, the warrant. All right, so xmit is going to be the bit we're sending. If xmit, <laughs> xmit, it's kind of a hard word to say. If xmit and one, so if the LSB, the least significant bit, is present in this value, then we're going to set that pin high. Uh, port one, okay. Else, da, 
that's right, it's low. And equals the inverse of one. Okay, so here's where the magic happens. X mit bit shift one to the right. So it's not rotating, it's bit shifting. So it's going to take the eight bits, shift them to the right, which means the LSB gets blown to oblivion, and then the second bit becomes the LSB. So basically, we're just putting them all in position so we can send them out one by one. And then, of course, in this case, which bit out increment. Break. And of course, the final case is 10, which means we're done. So in that case, port B goes high which is basically the, you know, now we're done, now we're just gonna, you know, wait for the next thing. And which bit out equals zero, which means uh, nothing happens. Now, if you noticed up here, uh, we set which bit out to, to 10 to start. The reason we do that is so when this code executes, uh, we'll jump here, that line will be made high, which again is the, you know, the default state, and then it'll be ready for data. So we're basically, we, we did that just to save ourselves a little bit of setup code down the road. Let's make another function, void send byte. Yeah, let's do uint8. The byte, xmit equals the byte. So we're passing a byte to this function and then we're copying it into the xmit variable. Because the xmit x bit variable is being destroyed as we send it out since it's being bit shifted. So this way we have a copy of it. Okay, and then which bit out equals one. By setting that to one, we basically enable the, uh, the state machine here to send out the data. Cool, all right, so I think that will work. Let's go over here. Let's just do a delay of uh, one second send byte A. All right, let's try to catch this. I see some sort of blip on the scope. Let's go into trigger and try to catch it. There we go. And it's all low. Uh, ASCII A would not look like that. So we did something wrong. Okay, I realized one thing we should do is we set which bit out to one, and now we should wait for it to be cleared. Oh, that's what I missed. Let's try to catch this again. Hey, there we go. Awesome, and you see I have uh, my bus on the scope uh, set up to read serial, and there it is. Hey, cool. So let's talk about maybe having entire strings. So let's add one called, uh, I don't know, printout. Oh, just to call it print, you know, be like old school basic, right? So constant char data. Okay, so the reason we call it a constant char is because we're going to be passing it data from flash that's, you know, it's not a variable, it's a, it's a constant, you know, basically hard-coded. Okay, so we have a pointer at data, so basically it's a pointer to the string we pass into this. So, uh, yeah, this is pretty simple. While, while there is some data, while data does not equal zero, zero, which is the string terminator, you know, zero, Send byte data increment pointer each time. Boom. So now we go down here, print hello. Zoom out, catch it. Bam. Hey, there it is. Hello. Let's make something that can print numbers because the way a computer thinks of a number is completely different than us. Go decimal, u int 16, the number, right? Okay, so in order to print a, you know, a binary number in decimal, we have to basically figure out the decimal digits. So we need a divider for that. u int 16 divider equals 10,000, right? because a 16-bit number goes up to 65535, which means we're never going to have more than five digits in this number. I mean, we could have more, but, you know, I think this is plenty for our purposes. Okay, so let's do a loop. For g equals zero, g is less than 
five. So it's zero, one, two, three, four, which is five or five iterations for five digits. This is how we do it. If the number is greater than or equal to the current divider, then we're going to basically divide it and print the digits. So we're going to send byte. Okay, so it's the number divided by divider, right? Think about that. So you've got, let's, let's just say it's 65535, five, right? Divided by 10,000 gives you six, right? But if we want to turn that into ASCII, we have to actually add 48 to it to get the ASCII value. So we send byte the number divided by divider plus 48. Convert to ASCII. Wow, that was fun. Now we take the number and we do a modulus divide, which is divide with remainder, divider. So that way it will divide it by 10,000, but we'll keep what's left. So we can basically chop the number up in bits and bits. So, so if you, yeah, so basically you would take 65535 divided by 10,000, which would give you 5535. I made some code to try to send the number 200, but you see all we got was two. Uh, yeah, we need to figure out what's wrong. Oh, I see the problem. If uh, one of the other characters is a zero, then this will never execute. So let's uh, put in a flag. Let's call it uh, zero. Why not? That sounds like something to be a reserved word. Zero equals zero. Oh, something. Sometimes you can just define a variable like that, but if you want to make sure it's a value, you should put it in like that. So uh, if we find anything at all, such as the first two in the number 200, then we'll set zero to one, which will now enable us to draw zeros. That way we won't see zeros in front of the 200. We'll just see it after, because otherwise it would print zero, zero, two, zero, zero, right? So then we'll do an else if zero. Yeah, confusing. I mean, it's all about how, you know, humans and computers don't think of numbers in the same way. There, that should do it. Okay, let's try it again. Let's go for single and tap the button. Boom, there it is, 200. Let's hook this up to a FTDI cable. That's basically a cable that has a FTDI chip built into it so you can easily communicate via serial. All right, we're just going to need a ground and receive. Okay, I've got a serial terminal here. Let's see if we can uh, pick anything up. Ah, there it is, 200. The debounce, as we mentioned, is not super great. Uh, oh, uh, we don't have a carriage return. I guess it should be your choice if you want a carriage return. So in ASCII, it's, well... It's usually carriage return and new line. So we go decimal 200, send byte. Uh, take a look at this. This is what art should be. Oh yeah. All right, let's look for this. Uh, carriage return new line is 1310. All right, send byte 13, send byte 10. Cool, so now we have everything we need to basically get human readable data off of this tiny little micro. So let's try one more thing. Let's hook a sensor up to it. So this chip actually has an analog comparator, which basically says, hey, is one pin higher or lower in voltage than the other? The other one is the analog to digital converter. That's the one we're gonna be using today. So what I've done here is I've added a Hall effect sensor. So Hall effect sensor, is a sensor that detects the presence of a magnetic field and then outputs an analog voltage relative to the intensity of the field. So the Hall effect sensor is hooked up to power and ground. And the last thing is this. This is the Hall effect sensor's output line. So we can use the reset line because was, as we talked about earlier, the reset line is a little weak for driving loads, but uh, the ADC on it is not affected at all. Oh yeah, take a look at this. So here's the MOX, right? So there's four ADCs, there's one on each pin. However, there's actually only one active at a time. So basically you're multiplexing it in, that's what the MUX means. And then it, you take turns, see? So we're gonna say, okay, we want ADC three, which is the one on the reset line. 
and we want to sample it. So it's actually pretty simple. So we go to the add mux, and this basically is a register that selects which uh, one you want to use. So ADC3 is the number three in binary, pretty simple. So we're just gonna go over here, add mux equals three. We also need to disable the digital output on that pin. So we're gonna go did r zero, that's another register, equals one, two, three, four, that since it's the fourth one. Yeah, also of great importance is the ADC control and status register A. Uh, yeah, then we also have to actually enable the ADC. So that's ADC SRA register. And it's, take a look here. Okay, so bit seven enables the ADC. And then the last two bits is the prescaler. So we need to go, so it's one, one, two, three, one, two, one, one. Cool. Enable ADC. Now, to start the conversion, we set this bit, ADSC, start conversion. So let's just copy that. Go down here. Uh, same register, ADCSRA. See, this is why you know, bitwise operations are so important, because multiple things are in a single 8-bit register. One bit shifted that much to the left. Start conversion. When the conversion is complete, that bit will be set to zero by the system. So we're gonna wait for that while ADC SRA and one dot dot ADSC. It's basically while it's one, do nothing. Wait for conversion. Okay, so when it's done, where do we get the value from? ADC conversion result. Now it's eight bits, so we just have the low byte. So it's ADCL. So what we can do over here is we can go decimal ADCL, and that will send out the value. All right, we can see a steady stream of 129 coming off of the ADC. So let's bring the magnet in. Oh, I'm gonna flip the magnet around. The polarity of the magnet and whether or not it's in front of or behind the sensor actually makes a big difference. There we go. See that? Go down, low number, go up, high number, go down. So yeah, we're using the ADC of the AD Tiny 10 to sense the value of the Hall effect sensor. And then we're using a bit banged serial protocol to send that data to a computer. Hey, look, I was able to fit the first three lines of the Great Gatsby in this thing. So now microcontrollers can bore English students to death. So there you have it, the Atmel AT Tiny 10, the little microcontroller that packs a big punch.